So, welcome, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you've been having a good day. Uh, welcome <coughs> to TED. You've just uh, arrived shortly, I think. Uh, mm -hmm. um, when we invite our speakers, we ask them to send us a bio, and we usually get some sort of cut and paste from LinkedIn or some blah, blah, blah jargon, and the first thing I do when I get that from the team is just delete it. It's my, not my job to recite your history. That, that's your job. So what I usually do is scroll through your social media or your Twitter or maybe your Facebook or Instagram, and I try very hard to find something that I think would be interesting for the audience so I can start to build that connection. Actually, it's kind of hard. You're not that much out there, <laughs> are you? No, I try to present to be online. Yeah, yeah which makes it really hard for people like me <laughs> to make you sound like a hero so you get the warm round of applause, <laughs> right? So I, th there's only one thing I can fall back to. Um, the company name is Clever Franca, and I think if you've got a name like Clever and Franca, then what a shame when you're the Franca, because yeah, doesn't everybody want to be clever? Yeah. So unfortunately, no clever remarks will be made today. Because <laughs> yeah, no he's not here. He's not here. Yeah, okay. But maybe we're going to get some honest and frank uh, comments. No, exactly. never mind. I'm sorry. That's Bad joke. Bad joke. Cup of tea. Yeah. Thanks for the drum roll. <laughs> um, so I couldn't find anything interesting or embarrassing. So I'm just going to give you the, 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 the short intro of here's a man who sort of lives to help people use data to create change. And I think that's a little bit about what you're going to talk about in a roundabout way. But you guys, this is an interactive session. You don't get to sit there with your arms crossed. Yes, I'm looking at both of you. Uh, one in front of the other. Yes, you too. Right? And just consume. That's not how it works. This is the 21st century. It's your job to participate. And it starts with you. Your job is to make all those people out there in the arena look this way and go, what am I missing? And you do that by clapping, cheering, Whistling, yelling, screaming, throwing underwear, whatever you're comfortable with, it's all good to make this man feel really, really welcome here at Campus Party. Can you do that for us? Will you do that for us? That was a pretty good practice run, and now we're going to do it for real as we give a huge Campus Party warm welcome to Mr. Gert Franke. Go! So... And, and after this introduction, I have to top this. That will be a hard one. But what I will do is just just to give you a brief idea of what our agency, Clay Franke, normally do, uh, does. I show you a short uh, movie, so uh, uh, just to get into the topic of today. You use your senses to explore your surroundings. Using the information you gather, helps you place things in perspective. Clay Franca uses data to create new perspectives. We help you experience your surroundings in a new and different way. The result is data-driven experiences and tools that captivate, inform and inspire. Our solutions will help your organization use the power of data to drive change. Helping people reconnect and explore the world around them. That's what we normally do. We, we do that for all kinds of clients uh, throughout the whole world. Um, but before getting into this um, uh, a really nice success story about how great we are, blah, 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 um, I especially want to focus on what all went wrong and what we've learned and the challenges we had. Because, um, of course, on our website, we present ourselves as this great design agency that can solve all possible issues and make, can make sure that the world will change. But um, eventually, uh, we're just two lads. Uh, uh, that's me on the left side, and that's Thomas, um, my, my business partner. And in 2008, we graduated from the HKU. It's the School of Arts um, in Utrecht. We um, studied their graphic design, and afterwards, we thought, like, okay, Let's join forces and set up a design agency. 
Um, and, and, and so we did. So we started Slave 400. Um, but when we started, we thought like, okay, what, what, what kind of work are we going to do? Because when we uh, graduated, our teachers gave us the feeling like that we should do all culturally interesting jobs like um, designing theater posters, uh, designing identities for uh, cultural institutions, etc. But we didn't really have an idea whether or not that was the, the, the best way to go and also if that was the work we would love most um, to do uh, throughout our, our whole career. So what we basically did when we started the business is take on every potential job we could get. So um, we started designing websites for um, all kinds of smaller uh, um, organizations, but also we did the identity or the campaign for the Utrecht introductie, uh, the Utrechtse introductie tijd, which is um, commonly known here as the introduction of all the students into the city of Utrecht, which is a one week a year at the beginning of um, the new uh, university year. Um, but we also designed websites for multinationals and just did all kinds of jobs to figure out what we liked and not liked. And after two years, we thought like, okay, we, we, we're doing all kinds of jobs. We know a lot of people, so therefore we get a lot of assignments, fortunately. People liked what we did. We didn't really uh, know why they uh, liked it, but we, we, we got jobs and we were happy and we enjoyed it a lot. We enjoyed our work a lot, which, which was a really positive thing. But after two years, we thought like, okay, what are the things we do best? And at that moment, we, th we thought like, okay, because we have to position ourselves if we want to grow. And because we're now just lucky to get uh, assignments, but that may be gone after a few years, that the luck is gone. So we should get more control over um, the, the uh, how we are recognized within the design industry. Um, so what we did, we got rid of a lot of um, things we thought we weren't so good at. Um, but still, we had a lot of stuff left there. We did corporate websites, we did graphic design uh, work, identity work, book design, etc., etc. So after a while, we start questioning what makes us unique. And I'm, I'm just wondering how many people are considering to set up some kind of consultancy firm, like a design agency or a software development company. How many people? One, uh, not two, three. The rest of you is going to look for a job? Um, that uh, you, you have a job, but you have an agency. Okay. Or, or maybe they're going to build products. Yeah, that, because I think, because how many people are considering to, to create some kind of product? Can you, can you raise hands? Qu quite a lot of people. But the big um, uh, upside of creating a product is that you immediately from the start will think about the positioning because people have to recognize you, they have to be willing to use you. Well, if you're a design consultancy firm, it's not that uh, uh, easy to be recognizable for uh, specific things you do. And people, by the way, feel free to ask questions and, and interrupt me whenever you like. But after a while, we, we start looking around, like, okay, so what are other design agencies doing? How do they position themselves? And we figured out that there were a few that were interesting. Um, in Holland, we have Tonic, that's a design agency. That's a design agency that has a really recognizable style. If you see one poster of them or identity, you will immediately recognize it's designed by Tonic. Well, there is also a company called Ice Mobile, which is specializing in the type of work. They only do mobile applications. So if you need a mobile application, you will probably go to them if you need a good one. But then there's also Youngworks that's positioning themselves on a target audience. Only young people between the age of five and 20. Well, there's also IDEO that's positioning themselves based on uh, process. Like, okay, guys, if you, n if you have a really complex 
problem which needs to be solved, we have a special process in which we can help you to find the best possible solution. So this is what we had in mind. Like we, we have to find something similar if we want to become recognizable. If the design agency will think of Clay Frank and immediately will think of, hey, that's the company that does something. But I think an, an, an other thing is, and um, I was lucky enough to find some really cliche images on Google image search, like this one. Uh, we were also questioning like, but what do we like most? What gives us energy? What, what keeps us energized? Um, and therefore we went back after doing all kinds of design work after two years, we thought of our graduations project because our graduation projects um, included um, data visualizations. And we thought like, hey, this is interesting because we're now talking about 2008 or 2010. And like data visualization is now almost well known. I can even ask my mother-in-law like, okay, what's data visualization? And she probably will tell me something with graphs, which is already a lot more than five years ago. Um, so we thought like this is interesting and we already tried to push clients to hire us for data visualization work, but it didn't work out. Because the thing was, they still rec recognized us for this kind of work. Because they thought like, yeah, Clay Franke, you can just call them for all kinds of assignments and they will just do their utter best to come up with the best possible outcome. So we thought like we, we have to find a trick if we truly want to position ourselves and want to find some place within the design industry, we have to come with a plan. So what we thought like is, let's create an example, because there was another thing. When we started in 2008, um, we started at this place. That's an attic in the build. Um, and that's also where our name comes from, because we started there, over there, we started the, the agency in the attic, just, just a, a, a basically it was my, my bedroom where uh, I also slept during nights because we were just graduated. Um, and we just placed there two iMacs and started working like madmen. But we had to came up, uh, come up also with a, um, a name for the agency. So what we eventually did was we thought of all kinds of names like frank and clever, indeed. It was also one of the things we considered. Um, but after a while, we thought like there's, there's one interesting thing also about the build, because at the end of the road where our studio was situated, there was this building. And that's the building of the KNMI, the Royal Dutch um, Metro Meteorologic Institution. Um, I'm not really good in pronouncing their name in English. Um, and they are known throughout the whole of the Netherlands as um, the organization in charge of predicting the weather of the, the, the coming days. Um, and they had tons of data, data which was used to create all kinds of really pretty images about what the weather will be the next day. But they were never used to create more in, from our point of view, more interesting uh, uh, visualizations of the weather. We thought like, hey, that, that, that might be something where we can play around with. Especially also because when we founded the studio, we thought of two lads that also had something to do with weather. Because there was Andreas Celsius and Gabriel Fahrenheit. Two guys that researched the same thing, but just had a slightly different approach of describing it. Because if you want to calculate the temperature in Fahrenheit to Celsius, you, you need to convert it. It's not immediately the same thing. Um, and it's also has to do with the personalities of me and my business partner, Thomas. <laughs> we both have a different idea of how to approach a design and how to approach business, but that's also our strength. So after a while, we thought like, okay, this is a nice analogy to use. So we came up with the name Clever <laughs> Franke. There it is, you see? Um, 
But still we thought like, hey, that data of the KNMI, that's interesting. So after two years we thought like, okay, let's, let's play around with it. Let's try some things with it. So we start sketching and eventually we came up with these um, so-called weather charts. So what we did was, what you see here is um, uh, simply um, uh, an overview of uh, all the days of 2009 visualized um, as one blob. So one, one point over there is one day in 2009. And the 1st of January is in the left upper corner and the 31st of December is in the right down corner. And that's what we did and we showed with red the temperature, with blue we showed the amount of rain and with yellow we showed the amount of uh, sunshine. And so we made this uh, uh, gigantic overview of the weather and um, this is what we shipped to a lot of people we, we knew. Just to show them like, guys, this is what you can do with data. And this is how you can sometimes uh, uh, dull data, how you can make it pretty and, and how you can use it to communicate something. So um, a lot of people reacted positive. Also some people reacted, um, what the heck should I do with this? And then we had something like, yeah, I, uh, we don't know, um, whatever. Uh, but a lot of people were really positive about it. But after a while, also some people came to us and said like, um, yeah, but, but Gert, is it like that the, the there are just a few days a year where it rains a lot, like here, 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 and here, and over there, and the rest of the year it is, there's not so much rainfall. And I was like, yeah, yeah, I think that's a pretty good conclusion. Um, but after a while we start doubting whether or not that was completely correct because we start investigating what we did and because what Thomas and I did was design one of these circles and then ask a developer to automate this so that we would have the whole thing uh, available in Illustrator and that we then could adjust it and, and make it pretty but the rough shapes were produced with a a small Java uh, uh, a program. But we started questioning, like, did we brief the developer correctly? Because what we did was, if there was one millimeter of rain, we me made the radius of the uh, circle one millimeter. Well, if there was two millimeters of uh, uh, rain, we made the radial um, two millimeters. But after a while we thought like that's a pretty big difference be because the left one looks a lot smaller than the right one. So we made a terrible mistake because the total surface of the, of the left one is a lot bigger than the right one. So <coughs> we learned a lot that this is not the way you should approach it and that you should always keep track whether or not the things you are doing are correct. So we felt like really stupid idiots when we figured this out and thought like, okay, this we really have to prevent this from happening again and uh, afterwards we always re-evaluated the stuff that went out of the door, whether or not it was correct. Luckily enough, we made a, uh, quite a, uh, um, a few extra uh, the years after we, we produced other weather charts as well and currently we're working on a new one as well. But then we, we, we sent out 200 of these weather charts. So we were really curious, like, okay, who's going to call? Who, um, yeah, when can we start designing data visualizations? Because the, the, the overall reaction was really positive. So we thought, like, okay, I think we're on something. So uh, we started waiting. Another uh, thing I found on Google Image Search. Um, um, and we, we, uh, we waited. But we had to wait for w one whole year before somebody approached us like, okay guys, I've seen that weather chart and I think I have uh, a job for you you could do. So, and that was the SNS bank. Um, in fact, that's the neighbor of this building because the SNS bank, if you walk out of the Jaarbeurs, it's on the left side. It's one of the major banks in the Netherlands. Um, and they sent us this uh, uh, really small briefing where they requested us like, okay guys, um, 
we have to have a KPI dashboard. And KPI stands for Key Performance Indicators. Because what they wanted to do is internally do the ev evaluations with their colleagues based on the, the uh, predefined KPIs of the start of that year. So they had a few things they wanted to measure, like the amount of sales, the amount of people on their website, the amount of tickets, um, um, the, the amount of tickets the support desk uh, uh, sold, uh, etc. So they had all kinds of, of things they want to keep track of and by which they want to evaluate people. But they needed something um, that showed the colleagues the progress of those KPIs. So what, and, and we, we, we really didn't have a, an idea how to approach this. So what we thought of was like, okay, let's, let's sit together with them, ask them what their priorities are, and yeah, figure out what the goals of the solutions should be, what we would came up with. But um, to be honest, we didn't really uh, know what we were doing. We just thought like, okay, we have to find out s some way where we can determine the goals. But we just tried. And to be honest, we were lucky it worked out well. But in, in the beginning, we just tried. We thought of like, okay, let's just bring those people together, then start figuring out what the goals should be. But on the other hand, also start discussing the data because the data is defining the possibilities we have to visualize. Because on one hand, we need to have an understanding what the potential outcome can be. But on the other hand, we also should have a clear idea of what the possibilities are we have with that data. So we start um, uh, uh, digging into the data, researching what kind of parameters it was, um, how many times a day they were updated, um, uh, uh, from what kind of source they would come from, so that we c uh, were um, gathering some kind of overview of all the things we should keep track of. And based on that, we start sketching with them. This was another day. And we just asked them like, okay, sketch one graph. How would you like to see the, the uh, um, for example, the amount of bank accounts uh, registered? And we thought like it would be, would be quite cool to make some kind of uh, pig, which then will grow, or some kind of tree that would would grow. So we also start sketching like real designers, like all these cool ideas with with clouds moving, that, that you had some kind of feel about how the company was doing. Um, but the funny thing was that we also start uh, voting, ask them like, okay, vote for good and bad ideas, and it immediately all told us like, guys, cut the crap. We we don't want to see trees growing or something metaphorical. We just want to see numbers. Numbers, red and green lights. Where we thought like designers, like, no, we, we have to make it pretty, you know? People, it has to be sexy, etc. But they immediately made clear to us, like, guys, we are in the banking industry. The banking industry is uh, used to see a lot of numbers, green and red lights. That's, that's the world we live in, and that's fine for us. That's how we work. So it immediately gave us a lot of information about what they liked and what they didn't like. Then afterwards, we start discussing these sketches and just ask them like, okay, what are your ideas about it? And then we told them like, okay, please leave for one, for three weeks and we will come up with some concepts. So we, we created a few concepts based on all their input. What they really liked was to have some kind of CNN uh, news report screen where you would have a lady telling all kinds of updates, but in uh, uh, in between also some kind of ticker underneath the screen which was giving you results updates um, but we didn't thought that was the best way to go um, but eventually we had to bring everything together so we had the goals where they defined like okay guys this uh, this this and this should be in there this kind of functionality should be in there this is the data that should be in there and oh yeah by the way you have to include 74 KPIs so we had to include 74 different data streams into one dashboard. That's a huge amount. To be honest, I never had to deal with such a, uh, a huge amount of different data sets afterwards. So um, eventually, to, to bring it all together, we, ha we had to work hard because we had to figure out some way to bring it all together. Um, and after a few nights of not sleeping, um, we came up with this result. 
but it really took us a lot of hard work to get to this. And um, to be honest, we were really happy with the result. Like everything was in there. We we uh, we made a, a clever setup by which we visualized all the parameters in one standardized way, where you would see the total amount that uh, reached at that point. The target is behind there, and on top it shows the difference in what the target should be uh, and what's really realized. And it worked out pretty well, but I go back one screen. On the other hand, we also had the feeling like, okay guys, will this be useful within your organization? This is such a tremendous amount of information. And yes, if you have somebody going through it with you for half an hour, explaining all the functionalities, explaining what you're seeing, you will be able to work with it. But it's not something intuitive and something that really is immediately conveying a message. And that's something we figured out like, okay guys, we, we, we should be able to question our clients in a better way. So afterwards, we went on a course just a traditional course, just like you guys pretty much are doing this week, just following a lot of uh, uh, trainings and, and working together, but we, we went on a course just to improve our communication skills. Because a lot of this has to do with asking the right questions to your client and avoiding subjectivity and assumptions. Because as a human being, we are all used to have a lot of assumptions and this is something we learned during these kind of trainings that you really should prevent in the way you ask client questions to avoid assumptions and to avoid subjectivity um, but based on this uh, SNS dashboard because it was a huge success eventually it was presented at the uh, conferences and everybody was really happy but we still had something like we can improve a lot we can tell a better story and make sure it conveys a, a, a better message. So, um, but luckily enough, two years later, after we've already did a, a couple more dashboards, Google approached us. Um, they approached us pretty much with this briefing. This was the whole briefing. Th th this was it. Th and they asked us to create a new data platform in which you could investigate or research data uh, they had gathered by doing a really big um, uh, international research um, about to what extent people use the online and offline uh, uh, marketing channels to gather information. To so, so, in other words, to what extent if people are standing in a shop, do they look up under a cell phone what are the reviews of the product that is in front of me? And to what extent do they buy products online, but still go to the shop to see whether or not they like the texture, etc. And they gave us this briefing and asked us to pitch. So what we eventually did was, again, work, work, work really hard, you know. Um, so we, we got used to not sleeping that much, etc. Uh, but eventually we won the pitch. So we worked we were really happy because we thought like, oh man, we could work for Google and we can create something really great. So um, this is what we came up with. Um, it's um, wh What it basically does is um, it, it enables you to go through um, the data and we have some predefined settings of the data and um, in between you can read a story about differences between different countries and how people are using the internet to uh, buy uh, products. Um, but, it, but it was a really extensive research. The, uh, TNS had interviewed one, uh, 100,000 people for one and a half hour each. And this interactive map shows um, all the parameters that were in the, uh, in the data. So it was some kind of interactive um, uh, site map by which we enabled people uh, to plot their own graphs. Um, and this is uh, something, uh, Google was extremely enthusiastic about this because the previous version of this consumer barometer was a really simple um, graph plotting tool. You could simply select a few parameters and then plot a graph, that's it. Well, this was some kind of experience for the user. Um, but on one day, uh, Google called and they told us like, guys, 
we have uh, good news. Uh, we're going to launch tomorrow. We were like, okay, cool. Uh, you are aware of the 100 books that are still on our to-do list? And they are, were like, yeah, whatever. Um, doesn't really matter. Uh, just fix those five because they are quite critical, but then just put it online and continue your work. Um, but we just want to launch it. So um, we thought like, okay, cool. Now finally big things are happening. We are going to launch a product for Google. How cool. So the day after, um, they launched it. Um, unfortunately, um, we, we felt a little bit like this, like uh, just waiting for stuff to, uh, to, to start happening because we thought like, okay, there will be uh, tweets about this, people will start talking about this, and we thought like, yeah, that, that will be really cool. But nothing really happened because, yeah, nobody was telling anything about it. Because we asked Google, like, okay, guys, how are you going to promote this tool? And they were like, yeah, we will ask our press department to send out a press release, and then, uh, yeah, that, that, that will be fine. Um, unfortunately, the lady at the press department was uh, sick, so she didn't have time. So nothing happened. Just months after the launch, bloggers online figured out this website and found it and started blogging about it. And then the whole publicity about this started. But until that moment, nothing really happened. So then we knew we have to change something in the way we work. And I'm just going to show you our current process. Um, and we, we, we had many iterations on this. And this looks like a s really simple flowchart. Um, but to be honest, we've worked on it quite long. Um, but what we basically do is now having four phases in which we say we have some kind of discover and refine phase in which we try to figure out the best possible outcome of a project. Then we have uh, an ideate and prototype phase in which we um, uh, try to validate what's defined as the outcome is truly the thing that should be the outcome of the whole project. Um, and then uh, we start delivering. But one important thing is that we then also start promoting and that we are in close contact with the client like, okay, how are we going to bring this tool to the market and ensure there will be traffic also on this website? Because what was missing with the consumer barometer was that it was a great experience and people really loved it, but it was lacking an ID to get traffic to that website. And that's what they simply forgot. And therefore, in the beginning of when the, it was just launched, the product wasn't a success. Because although it was a really nice experience, nobody f uh, found it. So there was nobody using it. Um, one last project I wanted uh, to show you is something we did um, in 2015 for the city of Chicago. Um, Chicago, the uh, or to be more uh, specific, the Chicago Metropolitan Agency for Planning. They're in charge of planning all uh, infrastructural uh, projects in the Chicago area. Um, and Chicago, as you may know, is a city in America, but they have a couple of problems concerning their infrastructure. One of the problems, and, and there are three major things to, to, to know. One is they have a lot of overdue maintenance on their infrastructure. So they, they need a lot of investment to just keep it up to date. But the city is also growing rapidly. They are now in 10 years growing from 10 million people to 12 million. That's a rapid growth. And the third is that they are an important transport hub for America. A lot of cargo goes via Chicago. And the whole logistic industry is a vital part of their economy, and they need a proper infrastructure. But nobody wanted to invest more money in their infrastructure. So they um, came to us and asked us, like, okay, um, we need something to show the people what the real problem is, and that we should do something about this. So what we did was we flew over to Chicago, had the same kind of workshop, but a little bit more refined now, uh, in 
um, in the offices of CMAP. And then again, started uh, uh, researching what their data, what kind of data they had available. So we were still using some, a lot of uh, the methods we use with that SNS bank dashboard where we just tried stuff, we're still using today. Um, but on the other hand, we also started uh, prototyping. Um, and for that, we just to do this, we, we just use also very simple uh, software tools like Excel, Tableau, which aren't hard to use. Uh, but we use also more sophisticated tools like QGIS, which is a really good um, tool to change maps and to do uh, a geo uh, informational uh, uh, to s or to adjust maps. Let's let's put it that way. Um, and we use processing, or even sometimes we build our own uh, Java applications. Uh, but we do also a lot with Illustrator, uh, After Effects, etc. And, and one funny example is what we've tried is we wanted to plot the in three dimensions the bridges on a map and show which bridges had overdue maintenance. Um, and we had all the locations of the bridges, but unfortunately we didn't have a starting and ending point. So we made this plot, but then we were like, okay, but how should we position the bridge? Where should it start and where should it end? So by prototyping, we figured this out quickly. While uh, otherwise, you, you could have the assumption like, yeah, this is something we will solve eventually, which uh, isn't possible. So um, in the end, we came up with this uh, website. I will just briefly show it to you. Um, you have here an overview which shows the most important roads and real uh, roads in sh the Chicago area. Then you have a short introduction which uh, tells you something about the topic. And then you have three um, subtopics, uh, and then you can go through some data visualizations, some uh, uh, movies are included as well. Uh, but perhaps this went a little bit too fast, so we'll do it a little bit more slowly. Uh, you have a homepage, and underneath there, there are subtopics about um, the road quality, transit, and freight. And underneath there, there are eight interactive data visualizations which enable people to look up the status of all kinds of topics concerning infrastructure about how it's going in their specific neighborhood. They can zoom in on the, um, on the topics and see how specific topics are doing. Um, but to make it a little bit more tangible, we included also uh, a few time-lapse movies, which we created just to show people like, okay, this, this is what we're talking about, to keep it really simple. Um, and um, these visualizations were included. I will just mention one. This one is about um, railroad crossings. Um, you have to keep in mind that, for example, a railroad um, crossing in um, America can cause 45 minutes delay. Because if a train um, will need to get to the harbor, which is in the, in the center of the city, um, they need to slow down. But due to the fact that trains in Chicago are a little bit longer than in a here, they're around two and a half kilometers long, you can have to wait for 40 minutes, which is quite a long uh, time to wait. So, so they have to make overpasses, but they are really expensive, and therefore they need more money. Um, one other detail is the technical optimization. Uh, due to the fact that it is a governmental website, we needed to make sure that uh, the website was also available, made available for Internet Explorer 8, which was quite a pain in the ass. Um, sorry. Um, but um, what we did was um, uh, we used all kinds of fancy web techniques, but also made uh, movies of them. And if the browser wasn't supporting uh, all HTML5, um, uh, techniques we could refer back to a video and if that video wasn't working we could refer back to an uh, image and that's oh sorry go ahead please yeah. yeah I got a microphone for you so we can hear you if there are any other questions please go ahead by the way but go ahead um, beautiful project by oh beautiful project by the way um, but how big was your team and was it all your own people or was it delegated you were like head of the team or 
How was it? Um, there were around, at the client side, there were uh, two or three people working on this. Uh, one statistician, which was helping us out with gathering all the right data. Uh, and one guy of the communication department and a project manager. Uh, at our side, at a certain moment, there were, I think, seven people working on this. So, um, yeah, half the studio pretty much was working on this project for a few months. Okay. Um, yeah, so you need quite a, quite a lot of people. Yeah, and you have a lot of data. And how, how up to date is that data? Is there like a, yeah. Yeah, that's a good question because these kind of data isn't measured uh, uh, annually. So uh, we had to figure out a way to present the data in such a way that we that was um, correctly presented, because the website was also meant for the media to uh, look up how uh, big the problem is, and they will always do fact checking in America. So if you don't present the data correctly, they will immediately uh, um, yeah uh, put you in pieces. So. Um, um it had to be correct, and so we, we juggled a lot with that. Um, just th so there, in every graph, there is a extra description which says like what kind of data this is. But it was in this particular case uh, very difficult because we had also to combine data sets because of some areas there was uh, up to date data, data, and of other areas there wasn't up to date data. And that was quite. Difficult and also, and now I'm doing something dangerous, and that's get getting back into my sheet. Uh, therefore, we also adjusted all the visualizations. Uh, for example, uh, this one is just roughly showing you the status of the road quality because we didn't have exact data of every street, we just had it of uh, certain parts of the city. Um, while in this particular case, we had data of every bridge. So there we showed the data of every bridge. Mm -hmm. So that's how we had to also, had while visualizing it, we had to play around um, yeah, with the data. And, and, and you have still someone in working on the maintenance, right? Because uh, bridges are being built and it roads It's are not live data, so uh, we can update it, but it has to d be done uh, manually. Mm -hmm. uh, it would be really great if we could make this live, but uh, that's... I think you can then uh, triple the project uh, budget. I was uh, going to say, that sounds like it was probably out of scope for the client. Yeah, yeah, indeed. Um, oh. Yeah, you Sorry, knew, I have you to look up my sheets again. You knew that would happen. Um, so, um, mm -hmm. this would be a good moment if somebody else is starting to think about a question to get ready for it, because I. I feel you're coming towards an end. W I'm coming to an end. Um, but at one day in January last year, um, we got a call like, okay, guys, next Monday it will go live. Make sure everything is set. So we made sure everything was set. And then in the afternoon, we got an email. An email of the client telling us like, okay, guys, um, you told us to get out there and make sure we mobilize the media uh, that's what we did, and please have a look to the first result. Um, and um, I will just briefly show you uh, one of the examples. All right, drivers in the Chicago area know all about waiting and wasting time. Our roads, bridges, and railway railways rather are tens of billions of dollars behind on repairs. But the biggest complaint, Dawn, is that nothing is being done about it. That's exactly why the Chicago Metropolitan Agency for Planning created this website. It takes tons of government data and makes it easy to digest so the public can push for action. Take mass transit, for example. We push it. Ridership, we push that, is at capacity at certain times on a number of lines. This interactive map shows how many people are boarding the CTA every day. You see that? More than 700,000. And then take the blue line to O'Hare, for instance. Nearly 10,000 people board at the airport every day. And here it is right here on the map. Our Mike Flannery used this tool to dig into the problems with our railways and railroad crossings. The Chicago so this is just a, a, a short part of the whole report Fox 32 made. Um, but it got, luckily enough, a lot of media attention. Uh, the, oh, the Chicago um, uh, tribute placed it on the front page 
uh, and all kinds of other media were reporting about this. And this was the uh, ultimate goal also of CMAP was uh, making sure there would be some kind of public debate about what they should do with their infrastructure and whether or not they should go more tax money to the uh, uh, improving I I infrastructure and therefore perhaps taxes should also be raised a little bit. Um, and currently they are um, uh, trying to make sure um, uh, they, they uh, make sure that there will be spend more tax money on uh, improving uh, infrastructure. One, um, before coming to my conclusion, um, there was one funny thing, uh, is that when this project was finished, we were really happy, like everything went well, we were able to handle the data correctly, um, it, it got the right amount of attention, a lot of traffic to the website, etc. cetera. Um, but uh, th this was the amount of budget we had and unfortunately the reality was that we had spent this amount of time. Um, and that's also when we started to improve our whole uh, process by creating a so-called toolkit uh, in which we have predefined workshops and stuff which we are now doing in a uh, predefined way so that it's easier for us to take, it, uh, uh, to take such jobs on. Um, and that's saving us a lot of time and also makes it sure that we become some kind of scalable uh, organization. Um, so also there has changed quite a lot with our team because it's not the two of us anymore. Uh, we are today, uh, we are with um, uh, around 18 people um, and there are not only any more designers in, uh, involved but also uh, that's our operational director with project management, with more project management, with assistants, um, and they make sure that we have some kind of smooth process. And that's really something we had to figure out. And if you ask me what's the most difficult thing to accomplish is to become as a, organi a service organization as we are, become scalable and make sure um, that everybody understand what they are doing and become some kind of manager um, and, and uh, luckily enough everything is going really well these days but that was really hard in the beginning to get everybody in the right way and make sure um, uh, that everything was done in a proper way um, and so uh, luckily enough we were able to hire this um, or to rent this space which is now also our office. Um, but there's one thing I, I, I wanted to show you, just as something where I think it's nice to think of. You d I, 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 I will just tell a, a few things about it afterwards. Um, but when we started the design agency, I looked up a lot of interviews with designers. And one of these designers was Walter Landor. He's the founder of Landor Associates, one of the biggest branding agencies in the world. They're in charge of... of uh, for example, making sure that the Le Levi's brand is consistently used throughout the world. And he was also the guy designing these brands. So he's known throughout the whole design in industry. But he was interviewed on his boat, which was the office of the design agency. And he was interviewed for a quarter of an hour. Um, and he was this really polite man asking all questions really correctly and politely. But then at the ending of the interview, and this interview was conducted in 1972, so almost uh, 45 years ago, at the ending of the interview, uh, the interviewer asked this question, and we'll just briefly show it to you. Everything's going great, Jeff. Personal question: Do you ever worry about it? Do you ever, do you oh ever sit up and say, "We're not going to make it this time"? Oh yes, my God! You have no idea. It's not just me. We might lose everything. I mean, there's this marvelous um, fear of failure, which spurs you on to greater effort and greater energy. But isn't that the kind of pressure that uh, people say ruins lives? This is part of the part of the ingredient of success, I think that you have to go through this fear of failure, fear of not making it this time, in order to exert yourself some more, to make sure it's going to work. As a man whose company deals with 
images, in essence. What is your image of yourself? How would you describe not Wal not Landor Associates, the design firm, but Walter Landor? I must admit, I, that's a question I haven't thought about, and I didn't expect. <laughs> what, is, what image do I have about myself? Well, to tell you the truth, I think I'm still struggling. I'm still building. Um, I don't think I have arrived yet. Um, and I think that's something designers and entrepreneurs are continuously doing, continuously doubting whether or not they will make it, if it's the right thing to do. But I think we should embrace that doubt and uh, just do, and just try stuff, do it, and please do. And I think you all uh, did a, a, a great thing by just coming here and, and looking at things, and also that hopefully starts something. And with that, I would like to conclude my uh, speech, but uh, hopefully you have a lot of questions left. Oh, yeah, thank wow. you. Yeah, there's an ending. <laughs> From starting to, well, not finishing the, the, the presentation, but uh, ending with some doubt and where are we going? And I think that says a lot about how you think about stuff. But my word, wasn't the data visualization fantastic? I mean, fascinating stuff. Thank That's you. pretty cool. I'm sure there must be questions from the audience. You've amassed one of the biggest audiences I've seen uh, certainly today or, or even this week. Now is not the time to run away. Now is the time to ask that question. And They're always a little you nervous. Uh, please feel free to ask the most bold questions, like what's my shoe size or whatever. Uh, you I feel I'm free to ask whatever I'm you I'm like. I'm guessing they're around a 47, 48? 49, yeah. Wow, big yeah. feet. Yeah. But he's tall as well. Yeah. And usually what happens is it takes a minute for the first question, which is now up. And there's the second one, and then there'll be a Great. third one. I'll be back in a moment. Hang Great. on. Uh, in between, I will do... Who was it? Somebody was... Yeah, hi. What's your name and what's your question? Hi, I'm Fadwa. And uh, my question was about, you followed the training about communication. I'm curious, actually, what other trainings did you have to follow? When did you realize, hey, I missed this, or we missed we miss this kind of information or, or training in our you know, work? Yeah, um, uh, good question. Thank you. Um, uh, I think continuously there are new challenges. Because when we started the business, our main objective was convincing clients that we could do something for them so that we could start producing work. Um, and, and so I followed courses in how you should approach clients, etc. Um, afterwards, uh, we had to come up with a better process become th because the, the work become became too complex to just go to a client and ask, okay, what, what's the thing you like? So we started digging into that and with that we, we read a lot of books, etc. Afterwards, um, uh, we were uh, starting hiring people and then we had to figure that out. And currently I'm trying to improve our PR strategy and I'm, I'm talking with all kinds of advisors like, okay, how as a design agency can we improve our uh, PR? Because we, are, we attract clients throughout the world. PR is for us also something we do on a worldwide stage. So, um, uh, and that's quite hard to do. So I'm, I'm now gathering information about that. So it's continuously while the the uh, agency is growing, I have to grow also with the things I know, else it's, it becomes an uh, unsteerable ship, as we say in Dutch, but I'm not sure if that's correct English. Yeah, no, yeah? it's, it's, yeah? it's pretty okay. good. And, Great. and talking about being on stage and worldwide PR, I think you're doing a pretty good job so far. <laughs> I wonder <laughs> how many people have noticed they are actually recruiting, so I don't know if there's any developers in the room, but Please take note of that. Me. Uh, we got a question here, so uh, what's your name, what's your question? Um, my name's Shurd. Um, I, I, I was just wondering, did you ever do something with mobile uh, a data visualization? B because the stuff mm -hmm. you do is really, yeah. really, really visual, and yeah. I think it's a really hard job if you have to do it on a little mobile screen, make it yeah, human, uh, uh, your data visualization. Yeah, definitely, because a lot of our uh, visualizations are still quite complex, and uh, uh, also, therefore, um, complex to interact with and um, it's a little bit like the same thing that you don't use Excel on your cell phone you know you, you don't use it because you need some surface yeah uh, some people do but but most of us are 
us, I don't think, do. So therefore, also, uh, in, in many cases, it's, it's not part of the scope of the project that we should optimize it for mobile uh, telephone. But sometimes we have to do, and then we are really limited. Then it becomes much more uh, a functional thing than uh, a really experience uh, uh, kind of uh, project. All right, I got another question on this side. Hi, uh, my name is Slow. I'm a data scientist at Oxford University. I visualize networks for a living. Um, basically, I've, uh, over the past few years, we've been div um, seeing this cycle of different design paradigms from, uh, you know, like uh, heralded by Apple and Google towards, you know, material design, flat mm -hmm. design, and so mm -hmm. on. So, do you follow these cycles or do you try to have your independent voice? What's your take on these major uh, design <coughs> cycles? I'm, uh, I'm a, a true believer in copying. I think it's a great thing. Please, guys, do. Don't reinvent the wheel, please. Um, but so we, we are also trying all that kind of stuff. But we also like to do stuff on our own way. So on one hand, we like to copy. But on the other hand, we also really pick at it and always think we know better. So based on what somebody else made, we, we, we try to iterate and, and find our own way. Um, yeah, so we're the, the stuff you're mentioning, I, we, we tried it all. And, and um, currently, we are really trying how uh, to figure out how we can combine more storytelling elements with the visualization. So using movies, uh, audio, uh, all kinds of stuff to get a more enriched experience. So that's what we are currently trying to obtain. And also to figure out new narratives by which we can uh, uh, tell data-driven uh, stories. Interesting. Data-driven stories. A phrase I think is going to be a lot more heard in the next few years. Yeah, definitely. Uh, straight into the next question. Yeah. About reinventing the wheel, uh, circles were a really big thing, I think, now for 10 years. Just all these circle-like visualizations, that and even, even before. Uh, is there something new coming to? I, I don't know. Um, we sometimes get that command as well, like, guys, you're, you're, you're doing a lot of stuff with circles. And I'm always like, yeah, OK. Um, um, uh, I, I, I understand the, the command. But sometimes it's just the most appropriate solution for a problem. So, and and yeah, that's basically that's why we look to. But you know, there's nothing wrong with hexagons either, right? No. Taking the right tool for the right job. Yeah. I got one more. Uh, she's actually hunting down the microphone, so <laughs> no pressure. Actually, to rebound on, on this question, how about 3D? Yeah. Yeah, we used it also for the Chicago project. And to be honest, uh, I don't think we, we used it in the best possible way there. Uh, the whole idea was that you could have several data layers on top of each other. Uh, but unfortunately, due to the data and, and all kinds of uh, requirements that were set, we weren't able to obtain that. Um, oh, 3D printing. Ah, physical 3D Physically, visualization yeah. so of data. Let me, let oh. me, let, let me uh, conclude that what I was just saying is that I normally hate 3D visualizations so, um, uh, because they really have to uh, have a purpose and they in, in many times they don't have. Concerning 3D printing, that's a really interesting one. Um, and uh, we, we haven't tried anything yet. All the examples I've seen out there I didn't thought were that successful either uh, because uh, the great thing is with interactivity, if you add interactivity through 3D, you can guide the user through the three-dimensional space, while if you just have an object, it's really hard to guide that user. Um, and that's something we still have to figure out. So, so go. So like, she's thinking big. Yeah, I, I once did. Uh, um, <laughs> but you can use a lot of stuff to visualize data. So you cool. don't, like we are using graphs to some extent. Uh, but you can also use your uh, pepper, salt, uh, uh, whatever. I've got a feeling you guys are going to be talking yeah. pretty much after this. Is that we got time for literally one, maybe half a question? If there's anybody who's really, yeah, you would be all the way at the back, right? All right, <laughs> no worries. I need the exercise. <laughs> Thanks very much for your talk. Uh, I was uh, thinking back with a friend some maybe some day ago about the use of VR for visual yeah. uh, data? Um, yeah, again, with, with all these kind of fancy technologies, uh, in general, um, there is not yet some kind of standard set. So therefore, if you want to bring across complex things, it becomes even more complex. 
because the interactivity, how the interactivity works with those kind of objects is for the user already really complex. So if you then also add complex data to that, you have uh, in, in some cases a double complex effect. Um, although VR is a really powerful tool to show worlds, to show people different perspectives of the world, as the introduction movie also told you. Um, so I think it is an interesting um, medium, but I still think we first have to become more common with it, and then we can also uh, uh, let the user do more complex stuff with it. Okay? Nick, yeah. I, I think it's up to you now. We're back, indeed. Um, we are precisely on time, so thank you so much for that. You're um, I don't know, when, when did you walk into the building? Uh, two you hours ago. So you sort of pretty much came in, you had a bit of a look around. Yeah. Did, did you see the hall with sort of next to here and next to the drones? Not yet, but I'm really curious. So I, right. I will uh, go, go so check it out. It's a bit of a campus party tradition that the uh, campus heroes coming in from all over the world uh, get to sleep here and they get to sleep in the tents. We're, you know, sort of not expecting you to do that, but we think you might like the experience anyway. Great. So that's a campus party tent, so <laughs> you've had the full experience. You can go Great. home and set it up in that beautiful office of yours or maybe at I'll home. I'll do, uh, I'll do. Uh, whatever you want. Ladies and gentlemen, please, a huge round of applause <laughs> for a fantastically visualized presentation.